All right, we're going to give it a few minutes for attendees to get on here. Um, thank you guys for joining us and thank you panelists for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to give the attendees a few moments so they can log in, get settled, and then we'll be getting started here in just a moment. Maybe I'll take this opportunity to turn on the light. <laughs> So just another minute or so, folks. Thank you for your patience. I want to make sure everyone has a chance to get on before we get going. Um, I'll start off by introducing myself. I'm Nick Cortez. I'm the chair of the California Progressive Alliance. This is one in a series of our, um, what we're calling Alliance Community Exercises. This particular exercise is being hosted by our allies in Los Angeles, the Feel the Burn Democratic Cub of Los Angeles. Um, and I'll be introducing our panelists shortly. If any of our attendees would like to introduce themselves, you can you feel free to do so in the chat box. Um, you're more than welcome to. Um, we're happy to have you all here. So I'm going to go ahead and get going here. It looks like people are still logging in, but um, we're going to get rolling. I'll do some introductions. Um, so like I was saying, this event is in, going to be hosted by our allies in, in Los Angeles, the Field of Burn Democratic Club of Los Angeles. Um, I'm Nick Cortez. I'm the chair of the California Progressive Alliance. Um, this event is being recorded. And you can find the link to the recording on the California Progressive Alliance website after the event. Um, so if you'd like to come back to this, you'll be able to do so. We will be fielding questions throughout and do our best to answer those questions. Um, we probably will not be able to get to every question, but we will do the best we can. We're breaking this event into two parts. So we will have a Q&A after part one, which is focused on a uh, Bernie campaign autopsy. And then part two, we will be talking about the Democratic National Convention and delicate selection process. And we will have some time for questions after both of those, after our panelists um, give us some of their, their feedback and input on those subjects. So, um, so each section will last about an hour. We are expecting to end around 9.30. We're very glad to have you all with us um, during these crazy and, and um, very unusual times. Um, you know, every panelist we have here tonight I'll be introducing was very involved in the Bernie campaign. Um, and most of you I'm sure that are um, joining us this evening were involved in one way or another. Um, you know, uh, going into, um, well, let me introduce our, our panelists now. So first off, we're going to have um, Melissa. Melissa Mitchelson is going to be um, leading us in the first part. Melissa was a 2016 national delegate and whip at the Philly DNC. Uh, she was founding president of the Field of Burn Democratic Club in Los Angeles. She's been a hardcore Bernie activist for, uh, for many years. Um, she's uh, Democratic Party California State Delegate and incoming LA County Delegate to the Democratic Party. She's a former field organizer for the Bernie 2020 campaign in Los Angeles um, and in 2019-2020. Uh, she's been a longtime activist and organizer. And we're going to have also um, Fiorella Isabel oh, joining us as well. She's an independent journalist and a news reporter for the Convo Couch and for KPFK News. Fiorella has been a Bernie supporter for the past five years. Um, she's volunteered for both uh, Bernie's runs for presidency. Fiorella also traveled uh, this primary 
to several of the states, including Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada to cover the elections. Here in California, she was able to report on all the election integrity issues and saw firsthand how voter suppression and corruption ran rampant. She also saw how the Sanders campaign mishandled the organizing and abused the grassroots, pushing them away. Um, she wants to tell her part, her truth, uh, about the fraudulent establishment co-opting of the movement. Um, so we're gonna give her an opportunity to do that. And um, we also have Bobby Joe joining us. Um, she is a Bernie DNC delegate, also a Bernie 2020 Regional Field Director, and Jenny Lynn will be joining us as well, a Bernie Field Organizer and um, photojournalist, activist, organizer. And Paul Padilla, he is um, a Bernie volunteer, Bernie member um, and, uh, of the Field of Burn Democratic Club and um, a Party Central Committee member as well. So welcome all of our panelists and thank you all for being here. And, uh, and thank you attendees for joining us for this important discussion. Um, I'm gonna be handing over just in a moment to Melissa, but um, yeah, hopefully people find this conversation tonight valuable. And like I said, it will be recorded and it will be posted on the California Progressive Alliance website afterwards if you would like uh, access to it after. So. Thank you all, and I'll be handing it over to Melissa now. Thank you, Nick, so much. Thank you, and thank you to the panelists for being here and everybody that's watching live right now and everybody who will in the future watch. Um, my name is Melissa, as Nick has introduced me. Um, I just want to talk really briefly about the uh, Field of Burn Democratic Club. We're a chartered Democratic club in LA County. Uh, we, cr uh, we were created by Bernie Kratz and for Bernie Kratz in 2017, and I'm the founding president. Um, we're dedicated to making sure the Democratic Party is one that has a firm foundation in the grassroots and one that upholds left progressive Democratic Party ideals, um, all in the, in the vein of Bernie Sanders, of course. Um, so some recent accomplishments, uh, one that I'm especially proud of and one that Paul uh, Padilla has been involved in personally is um, we started a corporate free pledge that we give to all candidates that want our endorsement. Um, so that's been uh, pretty successful and we don't budge from that. So if they are not corporate free, we don't endorse them. Um, also, we more recently, we've been very involved in the vetting of delegate candidates for Bernie 2020 for the national campaign. So we'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, and I just want to let you know that anybody who wants to join dues are affordable and we have hardship waivers. Um, I'll put the website link in the chat a little bit later. Okay, so um, we're going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to hand over the reins over to Paul. So um, this section is pretty much going over uh, who wronged the Bernie 2020 movement. Um, so that we can be warned and knowledgeable about what happened, uh, who was involved. Um, we'll review personnel and policies, essentially who killed the campaign internally and how it failed the grassroots. So uh, take it away, Paul. Can we unmute him? Or I can unmute you. I don't know. I, okay, there we go. Howdy, everybody. Uh, Paul Colpelia here from uh, San Gabriel, uh, California, outside of LA. Um, so, um, why did uh, the campaign uh, die, or at least get suspended? Uh, on your screen, you can see a, a comical um, meme that was put up by Scott Dakota online, uh, depicting the uh, killing of Caesar there as Bernie, with Faiz Shakir, the campaign manager, and Chuck Rocha, the senior advisor, and Jeff Weaver, the de facto campaign manager, who, according to numerous reports, are the three top people in addition to Barack Obama, who convinced Bernie to suspend the campaign. Um, so, you know, what led up to that? Uh, why was there such censorship uh, of staff in their tweets and their social media? Why was there such alienation uh, of and, and antipathy towards and attacks of the grassroots um, during the campaign from top leadership of the campaign? Uh, why didn't the campaign go after Biden harder? Uh, why did the campaign, of course, suspend? And why this purge 
that many of you have fallen victim to. Um, and now this attempt to muzzle delegates um, uh, take place. Well, uh, it starts at the top, folks. Uh, as the old saying goes, fish rots from the head. And uh, so I'll begin with Jeff Weaver. Um, you may have seen the news, uh, big news article breaking again today from Politico. Tonight's meeting is more relevant than ever, where numerous uh, former top staffers of the Bernie campaign uh, have spoken out uh, now uh, about uh, Jeff Weaver. They've been doing so for some weeks now. Um, he was the 2016 campaign manager. He started with Bernie initially as his uh, driver, as his chauffeur in a 1986 uh, campaign of Bernie's. And, uh, you know, like many other uh, characters uh, over the years, uh, rose from driver to top dog um, and attack dog, as it were, um, against uh, many of us in the grassroots. Um, so he, uh, you may have heard as well, uh, began a super PAC um, uh, shortly after the campaign was suspended in support of none other than Joe Biden. Uh, initially, it was called the Future to Believe in PAC. Um, but according to numerous reports, uh, Bernie was quote unquote pissed, upset, angry, incensed, and forced uh, Weaver and company to change the name to quote unquote, well, it was up to them to choose, but America's promise was what Weaver and company chose. Um, unfortunately, Weaver remains a senior advisor to Bernie, um, but uh, his primary focus now is, is on Joe Biden. Uh, we shall see if he uh, you know, parlays that into a position with Joe Biden if Biden were to be elected. Um, the super PAC is uh, him and Chuck Rocha, um, Shelley Jackson, who we'll talk about shortly, um, and a couple other people. Um, staffers um, who were opposed to Jeff Weaver formed their own PAC, not a super PAC, not in support of Biden, but still in support of Bernie and collecting as many delegates as many of you are here tonight, listening in candidates to get them elected to push for progressive priorities, not establishment priorities at the upcoming convention. Um, that group is led by Winnie Wong and Claire Sandberg, uh, you know, Brianna Joy Gray and um, uh, Nina Turner, those folks have really um, stepped up their attacks on Weaver and the establishment figures and forces within the campaign. David Sirota, too, uh, has been very outspoken about Weaver and some of these others. Um, perhaps Weaver's biggest mistake, in my view, and the lot of, view of a lot of folks, was not um, going after the African American vote enough, especially in South Carolina. Uh, we know that that was perhaps the biggest nail in Bernie's coffin by state uh, and was the resurrection of the political career of Joe Biden when he appeared himself to be uh, dead in the water politically. Um, so, uh, yes, Jeff Weaver, um, you know, uh, is not a beloved figure, shall we say, in Bernie world um, among the grassroots. Um, but let's go to his right-hand man now, uh, one of them, Chuck Rocha. Um, Chuck Rocha um, is in politics because he is legally banned from union work. He was convicted, admitted, pled guilty to embezzlement um, in his capacity as a union political director. Um, Jeff Weaver infamously in 2015 defended uh, Chuck Rocha, when this became national news, uh, saying that, oh, no, it, 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 why are you asking me about this? This is no, no, nothing to look at, nothing to see here. Um, Chuck Rocha is banned from working uh, for unions until the year 2026 because of the theft that he engaged in, engaged in going on golf junkets and personal vacations and even the Stanley Cup finals, um, all um, in violation of the law and his, his fiduciary duties to the union. Um, he, as I say, has started uh, up this super PAC with Jeff Weaver for Joe Biden. He also has started another super PAC called Nuestro PAC. Um, he is the uh, head of his own political consulting firm called Solidarity Strategies. Um, he and, and that uh, organization love the hashtag uh, that he apparently created, not Black Lives Matter, but Brown consultants matter. So very much a creature of the consultant class now in Washington, D.C. 
Um, in fact, we have a photo of him in the Fox News studio. He's a frequent guest on Fox, uh, MSNBC. Um, unfortunately, also on uh, Crystal Ball's uh, Rising. Um, and uh, he loves uh, TV appearances. He also loves his cowboy hats. He's a Texan, uh, a Texas Latino. And um, what you'll see in some other photos, I think we have at least one we'll be sharing with you tonight. A lot of the bootlicking, uh, uh, literally Texas bootlicking uh, staffers uh, in the top levels of the state uh, campaigns of Bernie 2020 started wearing these crazy cowboy hats uh, like Chuck Rocha um, to kiss up to him, uh, apparently. Um, so, uh, Mr. Rocha um, is also the executive board member of the Hispanic Lobbyist Association. So if you love lobbyists, you'll love Chuck Rocha. Um, I think that's all for now for Chuck. Why don't we move on to our next person uh, in the killing of Caesar photo, uh, Faiz Shakir. Um, Faiz, um, like Jeff Weaver, actually, I don't know if they were classmates, went to uh, Georgetown uh, University School of Law, uh, Harvard University. Um, he has a very impressive pedigree. Um, but he also has a very impressive pedigree to people uh, like Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid, as you can see on the resume, for whom he has also worked. Also, Neera Tandon and John Podesta were very impressed with Faiz, and so he was vice president of their Center for American Progress for seven years. Um, he was seen as, as really the, the right-hand man, uh, along with Rocha to Weaver, uh, on the right and left, I suppose, as it were. Um, but uh, because he wasn't as experienced or as close to Bernie personally, uh, he had that kind of more um, secondary campaign manager role. Um, so let's go on to our next person. Um, moving on down here to California, the head of the California campaign was Rafael Navarre. Um, he took over after Shelley Jackson was the first head and Shelley became his deputy. Uh, he too, uh, he comes uh, with an impressive political pedigree working for establishment Democrats along with unions. Um, Lauren Steiner uh, was one of the first to call him out and predict he'd be a failure as the head of the California campaign. And sure enough, in the eyes of many in the grassroots, he was. Uh, in the eyes of many um, here uh, in the grassroots, uh, the campaign in California was won not because of these people, but in spite of these people at the top level in the upper ranks. Um, I think uh, that's all I want to say for now about Rafael Navarre, but let's move on to Shelley Jackson. Um, as I say, the first California director of the campaign. Um, she reportedly is engaged to Jeff Weaver now. Um, the two of them uh, are certainly working on this pack together, the super pack for Joe Biden. Um, I'm sure they would welcome any wedding gifts you might like to send to them if they are getting married. Um, but I don't know if any of you will, uh, will indulge them in that regard. Um, uh, but yeah, they're welcoming all kinds of donations from the billionaire class um, for their super PAC. As you can see there, she worked for none other than the man who single-handedly killed single payer here, here in the state of California, uh, Speaker Anthony Rendon. Um, she has a long history with him and other uh, establishment Democrats in the California State Assembly. Um, and so I think that's all we can uh, uh, say for now about Shelley. We can talk about her some more later. Um, let's move on to um, uh, Jarrell Varela. He um, became the California field director. There he is in his cowboy hat impressing Chuck Rocha. Um, he is, to say the least, a very problematic individual. Um, some of you may have seen that uh, Meg Lay bravely and courageously came out um, saying that he sexually harassed her um, when she was seeking employment from him for the campaign. Um, turns out Meg has learned that uh, he was hired when he had at least one other open investigation of him regarding sexual harassment. Um, a couple of other folks have reached out to Meg about this and said they too um, know of or were uh, harassed by Jarrell. 
Um, we know that, of course, that plagued um, the 2016 campaign. Um, that was actually one of the reasons that Jeff Weaver, when our revolution began, uh, the majority of our revolution staffers resigned in protest over Jeff Weaver being hired to run our revolution before Nina Turner and uh, his desire to rake in money from billionaires and mega millionaires. Um, and so uh, the sexual harassment issue continues and um, we believe that Weaver and, and uh, Rocha overlooked, ignored, didn't care about uh, the, the claims of sexual harassment against Jarrell. Uh, in Jarrell's resume, uh, you might have noticed, uh, if you scroll down again, Melissa, um, many of us in Los Angeles were upset to see that uh, he worked for the notorious uh, Coalition for School Reform, um, the charter school organization trying to privatize our schools here in Los Angeles. Uh, he has a long resume, as you can see, working for establishment Democrats, including uh, Speaker Anthony Rendon, uh, just like Shelley Jackson. Um, and he too was transferred from California, uh, like a couple of the other people we'll be discussing, uh, to the New York campaign. And a question that uh, I and others in the grassroots, of course, have is why uh, were these people transferred? Um, why didn't New York have its own set of, of uh, staffers? Uh, and why weren't they from the grassroots? So let's go to our next person. Uh, Melissa Byrne. Um, she was responsible for the grassroots here in California and she has a fairly grassroots resume. Uh, however, uh, as you may have read on Facebook, uh, she is not beloved uh, in any way, shape or form by the grassroots here in California. Uh, she originally was from Riverside but has spent most of her life outside of California, uh, New Jersey uh, graduate in high school and all. Um, but apparently her Riverside roots got her the gig and she came out and certainly did uh, as much as she could to, I guess, alienate uh, so many people in the grassroots. Um, and uh, so not a great grassroots director to say the least. Uh, moving on down here to Los Angeles though, uh, let's move on to uh, the head of the LA campaign, uh, one Daniel Andalon, also known as Danny. Uh, he and Lewis Myers, um, Lewis Myers was the California field director, but we'll talk about it in a second, but just scrolling down on Danny's resume, you'll see that he's worked for a number of establishment politicians, um, including established politicians like Jimmy Gomez, who strangely, bizarrely was endorsed by Bernie, even though uh, he's very much a corporate funded uh, Democrat. Um, yeah, you'll see he worked for a lot of uh, Ref Rodriguez, uh, the disgraced now former LAUSD board member from the charter schools, bankrolled by them, working for them. Um, that was one of uh, Danny's uh, clients. Um, Mr. Andalon, is, as you can see here, um, yes, uh, yeah, he, he, he did not connect with the grassroots. The one and only time I met him I said, this, this guy looks out of place here. He was in a sports coat. Uh, we Bernie Kratz don't usually dress up for <laughs> grassroots events. And uh, then I learned more about him. Um, but yeah, um, Andalon and Associates, if you're ever in need uh, of consulting uh, as uh, establishment Democrat, I'm sure um, you could uh, employ his services. Uh, let's move on though to uh, the next person, his good buddy, his business partner, as it were, the co-founder of the 285 PAC, Lewis Myers. So um, Lewis Myers and Danny Andalon uh, on April 9th, literally the day after Bernie suspended his campaign, ran to the bank, perhaps physically, I, I'm not sure under social distancing and COVID-19, uh, but they uh, filed their paperwork the day after and they, uh, went uh, to the FEC and filed the paperwork right away to form a PAC for themselves, or at least of themselves, uh, purportedly for progressive or Bernie candidates and causes. Uh, I don't know any Bernie Krat though, uh, who has donated to that PAC. Um, Lewis, as will be discussed shortly, um, 
was a very problematic individual personally, um, to say the least as well, not just politically. Um, a very verbally abusive, emotionally abusive man um, who somehow was hired and somehow kept on in spite of numerous complaints um, at the East LA field office, which he ran as the LA area field director. Um, there's uh, they're, they're big Dodger fans, Dodger buddies, Lewis Myers and Danny Andalon. There he is with Shelley Jackson at the Venice rally um, consulting about something. Um, so, uh, I think that is it for now on the, um, the, the rogues gallery, as it were, the cast of characters, a cast of swamp creatures, as many of us say, who, uh, really helped kill the campaign nationally and in the state of California and here in LA. Um, we'll also be discussing other, other individual, Matt Berg, um, nationally when we get to the delegates portion um, of tonight. Um, but I think for now we've covered um, uh, this set of uh, <laughs> swamp creatures. Okay, thanks Paul. Um, okay, so now what I'd like to do is hear from former um, staff who are here on the panel with us as we remember together some of the issues uh, that we had while we were working on the campaign. Obviously all our experiences we're not all bad, um, but as this is an autopsy, we're gonna focus on some specific issues that many people may not be aware of uh, from San Bernardino, where Bobby Joe was working, uh, San Bernardino County, Los Angeles, where I was working, and then Orange County, where Jenny Lynn was working. So we're gonna focus on three areas in general. Um, so the general work environment, um, our staff retreat, we'll kind of talk about that, and then uh, Super Tuesday election fiasco and Fiorella will jump in in there. Um, so first up is the general topic of disorganization, lack of planning, um, difficult uh, work environment, hostile work environment. Um, Bobby Jo, would you, we'll, we'll have Bobby Jo relate anything she'd like about this topic, and then um, I will, and then Jenny Lynn. So hey everyone, thanks for joining in tonight. Uh, again, my name is Bobby Joe Chavaria. I was regional field director in the Inland Empire, uh, responsible for CD 31 and 35. Um, and we won both of those congressional districts, but uh, I think as Paul mentioned earlier, it was sort of in spite of the national campaign. Um, when we talk about disorganization, that actually is a picture of, I believe, the Riverside office. Um, and the storeroom of where a ton of literature and a ton of merchandise was kept. And it was so random about how they dispersed the, in, the, the literature. And it was very random about how they dispersed merchandise that like it was never available to actually access in the office or for grassroots folks walking in. It was always a kind of a mess to like go back and get like more supplies. It was just random and weird. Um, but that is the only office that opened up in the Inland Empire uh, for like the first two months that the campaign was there. It opened up in October. Um, it took a while for the OC office to open up. It took a while for the Coachella Valley to open up. And we had an office here in Fontana that technically never opened up because it was um, uninhabitable. It was unsafe. It wasn't uh, uh, accessible. It, it just never opened up. And I have a, um, I went that GOTV weekend uh, to see what was going on. And there was like three, three folks showed up for a canvas from the parking lot and they were launched from the parking lot. So um, it, and it was only the hard work of some grassroots uh, victory captains and and uh, Danny Garcia and Andrea Vega, who forced the campaign, uh, pushed the hand of California leadership to open up a grassroots office in Pomona. Um, and that was only open like the last three or four weeks uh, before Super Tuesday. So, I mean, that when you don't have a place to work from, then you can't schedule events, you can't schedule trainings, you're, you're scrambling. And that's where our team first was understaffed um and then never really given the resources um that you would expect from 
this large campaign. Uh, and the, the, that's the craziest part is that we still won. We still won in those, in those CDs, but how much more um, leadership could we have developed? How much more could we have then very quickly transitioned to other states and assist um, with, that, with bigger and better turnout if we had the resources in hand? I'll just leave it at that right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I want to piggyback on that. Um, in Los Angeles County, we, we, sometimes we didn't have Spanish literature. We ran out and then we had to wait a week, even though we still had canvases going on. Um, so, and then another weekend we had nothing, nothing in English. And so actually it, it was, um, really bizarre that we found out that it, it was all sent over to Riverside. So they had to send a bunch of field organizers in their cars rather than you know actually doing the organizing that needed to be done in LA, they had to go and pick up all the lit and bring it all back to LA County. So that was the stash of the missing literature for us um, in LA County. Um, I was rather disappointed that our office, I know there might, might have been money concerns, and of course, um, who knows who's uh, you know, running the, the finances uh, up at the top, but our uh, in Los Angeles, we didn't open up a, an office until October. Um, and even though the campaign staff, California staff were hired and had been hired in June, uh, the higher up uh, staff. Um, so the higher up staff were hired in June, July, August, September, October. Finally, there was an office, but that office didn't get used until um, uh, end, of, um, end of November, really. I mean, we had a grand opening in October, uh, they waited um, two days before the grand opening to actually clean it up and a bunch of grassroots people came over um, and offered to paint and do all the cleaning and all that stuff. Um, so we, we were there for that, but I didn't understand why we had to wait till the last minute. Um, Bernie unfortunately had his heart attack, so he wasn't coming, but basically we opened the office and then nothing really happened in that office um, except, yeah, until end of November when actual field organizers were hired. Um, another, let me think, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, yeah, I, I really wish there had been phone banking and a little more canvassing, not just on the weekends, but, uh, you know, bigger events, uh, planned there. Um, one of the problems, at least for me as an organizer in my district was at the beginning, we were told to build out and have a team and, and all of that. And then kind of and a knee-jerk change, change up reaction, which they euphemistically like to call the pivot, um, which is fine. You know, I understand we need to work quickly with a campaign and change, but if we're building out and having, um, you know, doing organizing in our districts, that, that takes time to build up and you can't just yank it back. And so by the time uh, they were, you know, by the time Lewis was telling me to yank it back and I was being told from above to cancel my, my phone banks, cancel my canvases during the week. Um, you know, uh, they just, it, it just seemed that there was this push for optics of everybody needs to, uh, we, all, we all needed to be phone bankers, professional phone bankers, to try to get people and drive people to only a few events uh, in LA County. And therefore I was told to cancel my own events. Um, in my area. So um, that, I didn't understand that. And, Melissa, uh, isn't it true, and I'm going to jump in here, but isn't it true that as the, as we got closer to GOTV when it was supposed to get bigger, these cancellations actually made the campaign smaller on the ground? Yeah, we had to drive people, we, people, our, our, our events in LA were canceled uh, throughout and everybody was supposed to somehow go to um, certain other events or canvases in LA is huge. People are not going to drop everything and go there necessarily. Um, yeah, I, I, I know we were spending like hours doing phone banking um, to try to get people to come to something when then there would be like 40 people there or less and paying all of us or organizers on the ground in LA to make eight hours of phone calls. Uh, it just didn't seem like it was working and uh, that that was working. So I wish that there, we had pivoted to something else. Um, so yeah, I was hired to be an organizer, not, um, I mean, I was hired to do whatever needed to be done, but I thought my job was to organize in my district. 
Um, and a lot of times, and, and in the field, <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the field, and and a lot of us wondered when are we all going to do our work? When do we get to do our job? Because we were actually doing it. I was having to do it, you know, before I went to work, and then after I came back from work, um, because right. at the workplace I was yelled at for not making phone calls, even though I did make phone calls. Um, I want to share that experience, and then I'll have uh, Jenny Lynn. You could jump in. Um, I want to share that. Uh, I just want to pay the, the the the. It was really difficult to work in the LA office, um, mostly because of uh, Lewis's uh, management style, and it was um, abusive. And I want to play this audio, which has never been played before. Um, I've received it, and I'm very appreciative that I have it because. It, it's just not, it was just really wasn't called for. So Lewis came out of his office one day, kind of in a rampage. He seemed to be triggered because Orange County, Jenny, you guys were making more calls than we were, apparently. That's what he told us. And he came over to me, hovering over me. I was on the phone with someone and he came over to hover over me and demanded I get off the phone. And he, he said, I couldn't have any more phone banks at my house. Uh, no more phone banks during the week, you know, the reason why I was having them because they were closer to for my volunteers to get involved in the campaign rather than go to the office. So anyway, um, Danny Andalon, his boss was there as well, full of volu several volunteers were there and the whole staff were there. And um, he got upset and uh, I've obtained this audio clip and I just want to play it for you. And this kind of behavior just made it really difficult for the morale in, in the office. And this is just one example, so. That's annoying. So, Steve, do you not take me seriously when I say that, or are you just guessing today? I'm giving you what you asked for. A yes, or an actual result? I'm actually giving you what you want, yes, sir. Then why is, she not, why is she not on the phone? I am on the phone. I'm taking notes on my paper. Earlier she wasn't. It says that on the thing now. This is, we're not arguing about this right now. Ryan, please, I want all FOs, and I want to see their callers, and I'm going to track every person every 15 minutes. Does everyone have access to this Google Sheet? Now we do. Okay. Yeah, I didn't until five minutes ago. Yeah, me neither. Okay, well, if everyone has access now, then now we can start recording all of our calls, conversations, and commitments. No voicemails. Everyone should. Okay, that was pretty much the extent of it. That just gets my heart. Racing. I even wrote um, a complaint to the union and outlined that, but nothing came of it. Um, all right, uh, I need to take a breath now. So, um, Jenny Lynn, do you want to take it away about what it was like working in the OC? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> okay, so first and foremost, um, the reason why we won California and the reason why we won every single CD that was assigned to us in Orange County is because of the badass grassroots organizing that our volunteers hired and not hired did. Um, we did not do it because of the direction of the state campaign. There was no communication with national whatsoever. Um, it was because of our personal networks. Um, because of, you know, our personal dedication because we are not careerists in this in this apparatus, we were doing it to, you know, help Bernie win and save the fucking world. That's what we were doing. Sorry. Um, so it was frustrating. Um, everything was always late all the time. And I understand that, you know, it's a progressive campaign. Um, not always having the materials might be something that is more just about campaign nature. Um, but it was just frustrating. There were different directives every single day. Um, and the only reason why we made more calls than LA um, is because, you know, they were basically just driving us like a freight train. Um, it really was about volume, whether it was about phone calls, about door knocking, about whatever the heck it was, it was always about high volume, high volume, high volume, which I do feel like there is a need for that for sure. Um, it's just more about, it became so much more about the numbers than about actually being a movement oriented thing, trying to teach people why it's important that they need to get involved and vote, educating people on the complicated voting process in California's, you know, semi-closed primaries and all that kind of stuff. Um, they were more interested in the volume. And to me, like personally, it was more kind of about like they lost the forest through the trees kind of thing. Um, 
it's, it's almost like they didn't understand that when you're on the phone and you're talking to a supporter and you're trying to teach them about the different actions and stuff that you're going to have, those conversations are going to take longer than, let's say, someone who hangs up on you. Um, you know, so that part was a little bit frustrating because it's like, I understand that there needs to be high volume, but there should be a happy medium. And it seemed like when we were having more uh, meaningful conversations, those were not even noticed or praised at all. Um, organizations like a lot of that just had to do with just like the changing directive like when we would get scolded for not doing enough doors for example like the next week after that like the doors didn't even matter and it was back to phone calls or if I was doing like making the phone calls because I made my phone call numbers every single week like if that directive changed where the phone calls didn't matter anymore, it's almost like that month of phone calls where I kicked ass of all the phone, like the numbers that I had been making every day, it was like out the window and not even noticed or remembered. Um, so, you know, that kind of disorgan, and I understand as an, as an evolving campaign, the directives are gonna change for sure. My point is, is that all the good that people were doing was not going noticed and they were more concerned about making numbers for their region. Um, it wasn't a healthy type of, um, you know, kind of uh, competitive banter at all. It was all like, you know, and when they didn't get what they wanted out of you, it was like shaming and, um, you know, you would get yelled at and called out and all this kind of stuff. And it was just, it wasn't constructive. I'm, I'm a really big proponent on keeping positive group morale a thing, which is important to do when you're dealing with the freaking establishment when you're dealing with these heavy, heavy topics like immigration, like DACA and Dreamers, like healthcare, um, and all of this kind of stuff. Like, you need to take the time to, you know, people are being affected, as we all know, in every single day. And you, you know, wouldn't be able to make these connections with people because you're being forced to run from, you know, one thing to another to another. It's just incredibly frustrating. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Did I forget? Oh, we're gonna do Q and A in a minute. Um, let's go to the next. Same, Keith okay. Anthony. Is that Same. The next? <laughs> okay, going backwards. Sorry, I'm going backwards. Here we go. Okay, so yes, let's uh, let's share a little bit of our experience on at the retreat. Um, I'll just kind of open it up to you ladies, Jenny and Bobby Joe. you were at the retreat with me. That's a picture of Bobby Joe that uh, where I was sitting. Um, the main thing that I remember from this was when we brought up as a group, what happens on Super Tuesday when they start passing out provisional ballots like candy, like they did that last time. And I remember um, Jarrell tried to field the, the, the question, um, but he basically said we were, that was like conspiracy theory about the provisional ballots. And then I remember Shelly Jackson running over from behind uh, in the back of the room, coming out and saying, keep, our, keep your eye on the prize. We've got it all under control. It's lawyer. We got the lawyers. Don't worry about it. But later when we'll hear from Fiorella and, and anybody else that wants to talk about it, on Super Tuesday, it was a shit show and they were giving out so-called conditional ballots and whatnot. So that was, that really stood out for me. And I think, um, I know for myself, I, I lost my voice that weekend, um, or that week going into the weekend, um, because I was having to talk so much. I also did karaoke, but also in the sessions, I had to talk because like ask the questions of, well, where's the materials for this? Or can we get the legal backing that you say is available? Where's the backup? We walked into the, into the training with all hands on deck. And we walked out with nothing more than we walked in with. We had no manual. We had no, um, no handouts, no training guides. They kept talking about this great mail program for, um, to, to get no party preference uh, voters. And then they did do some training uh, with some really great PowerPoints, but they were training on issues that we had not been briefed on. And then we actually didn't do any of those programs the way that we were trained. You mean um, like um, PDI? I mean, we use PDI. Is that what you mean? I mean, I no, I mean, I'm talking about um, there was a presentation on nightly phone banking and the nightly phone banking, um, nightly phone banking, like plan of action, um, the on campus 
action, uh, you know, planning of, of on campus um, recruiting and things, you know, it, like there was no substance. And then when we talked about canvases or launching a canvas or launching a phone bank, the only handout that ended up happening after that retreat was one that I had already developed and just shared with everyone because we kept having to reinvent the wheel of like every canvas. Oh, what did, well, you know, did I remember to, to, to tell them this? Did I remember yeah. to tell them this? Yeah, I remember it was, that document, we were hungry for that, for something like that. And when you kind of pop through it up and be like, I have this, we were like, ooh, can I get a copy? I want that. I, could, I have it right here too. I should probably grab it. But um, yeah, and the, the, the presentation, and Jenny Lynn, feel free to, you know, unmute yourself. But the, there was one really good presentation um, done by Shanti and Claire. Um, they were sharing it for, for PDI, which is the turf cutting program and um, phone banking, the kind of getting in the weeds and, and, and down and dirty with the stuff, which, I mean, our retreat was January 9th. We had been, and it had been postponed. Um, Multiple was, times. It, yeah, it's supposed to be in mid-December. We got hired at end of November. So, well, we, we were kind of flailing and, and, and making things up as we go along, so to speak, like learning and learning from each other, which was, which we did fine in, in the LA office anyway. But like I was hoping at the retreat, that's when they were going to really train us. And that didn't, or at least the one that Claire and um, Shanti did was the training that I was hoping for, but they shut that down really, really uh, fast, um, unfortunately. And just, we had to listen to um, more of Rafael Navarre's presentation, you know, just, you know. It, well, it, and, and actually, I remember, I yeah. I, it up better, I don't know. Sorry. Well, and I remember Rafael's presentation, um, which would have been really great in October. Um, and also would have been really great with some real meat because what he said at the, at the training was that, um, oh, this is like actually like a a two day training, eight hour day stuff. I'm going to go through it in the next like half hour. Let's see what we get through. Like it was, it was again, just so on the surface that context was completely lost in terms of organizing or whatever the reason why he was presenting that. And that's sort of how everything was. And there, again, no plan. There was no pr upfront agenda. They actually created the agenda as it was going. And we had a, like a handout that, or a, a poster, you know, posted on the wall that said, okay, this is what we have reviewed so far. <laughs> like there was no, like, it just kind of seemed like they were flying by the seat of their pants. They had had a plan. But it would they have been nice sure. to have known ahead of time. That's true. I especially know ahead of time that the um, the student uh, leader and you know Jenny, maybe you want to talk about this, but the student uh, campus leader she came out to give her presentation, and I've been really like excited to know what was the campaign, the California campaign, going to be doing on campus because I had been organizing students on campuses, and they hadn't been in communication with the student leadership. So I was like, okay, here we're going to hear what's going on. And instead of hearing all the things that they've been doing, Jenny, do you want to, well, now you're drinking, but okay. <laughs> yeah. so, dot, 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 you can fill in the blank. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, it's like, instead of figuring out, you know, what they had already been doing, they were basically asking us to do more um, and revealing to us that they had done nothing. Um, not to mention that this is not even in our job description, number one, which every single person in the OC team raised that concern of like, you know, we're already so bombarded with working, you know, like, and, 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 Regardless of, you know, what we're officially supposed to be doing with the union or not, we were all putting in work when we were out of the office anyway. So like on top of just because we're passionate about it and we genuinely want Bernie to win. So on top of what we were doing for these multiple hours a day on end, she was now asking us to take over these student spaces, um, regardless of if we had a network at these colleges or not, and um, basically taking on, you know, galvanizing a whole freaking campus. 30,000. Um, the college, one college in my district uh, has 33,000 students, and then there are more colleges. So that's, I mean, I was already dealing with the whole district of multiple cities. So yeah, I was. Yes. Just... And kind of to add on to that too, like, you know, I felt like 
because there was no program like released to us or no idea of what we were going to be doing, I didn't know when to ask questions because I was like, well, I don't want to ask this question if it's going to come up tomorrow, or I don't want to ask this question and waste this time if they're going to go over this for like two hours in an hour. Um, but you know, that never happened and we were never even given like one piece of paper of what we're going to be going over. So I didn't know and nobody knew like when was an appropriate time to ask questions. And when we finally did start to ask questions, they would rush through them um and, and i'll never forget like this time um like it was just it, it was so frustrating because like they were rushing you know like okay so they spent all of this time talking about this philosophical stuff and and that's great i love philosophy i love political thought that's my shit for sure but when we're going to a retreat out in freaking bakersfield and i'm like leaving my kid for multiple days and planning out and driving my car and all this stuff like i really want to use my time wisely and learn concrete tactical things that I can use to get Bernie to win in California and in my districts and, and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of it was really just kind of like 101 stuff. Like even, even Rafa's presentation was really great, but honestly, like I took consumerism and labor 101 in college. Like I knew most of that stuff, even though it was fun and entertaining, like it wasn't like incredibly useful for what we were doing on the ground every day. And I remember specifically when we finally got to PDI and Van, um, you know, Melissa had asked um, Shelly to slow down. She's like, can you just please slow down and talk about this for a little bit? Like, this is our bread and butter. I really want to make sure that we understand this because when we're out in the field, it's literally just us and, the, and this software and these brand new volunteers that don't know what the heck that they're doing. And, and the software was glitchy and having crashing issues at the time. Constantly, especially. constantly. Um, you know, which I know is not the campaign's fault, um, but still it's, you know, it's, it's just one of those, like we needed better. But I would say that it is the campaign's fault. One of the things that they needed to de develop on, what, well, one of the things that they needed to deliver on was the technology available for us, right? And I so if the, after the first week that PDI did whatever it was going to do, we already knew that it wasn't going to work. And instead of, instead of rethinking the, why we went into a, a, into a program or using a program that does what it does often, instead of rethinking that, the responsibility was put back onto the field organizers and the RFDs to say, okay, well, do paper backups, do this, do that, like, you know, do your cutting your turf, like the adjustments were supposed to be on our workload rather than say, you know what, this technology is not delivering, let's go back to what works. Let's go back to van. I think the dichotomy right. between this is that we were getting blamed for that software not working rather right. than them saying, okay, we understand that the software is faulty, but this is what we have to work with. Um, right. It was all falling on the FOs and, and constantly the blame was falling on the FOs all the time, every single day. Um, when it really, you know, we would raise these concerns and, and they would be like, yeah, okay, cool. And then the next day they would blame us again. So Jenny Lynn, um, did what, I don't know if you finished the story. I don't remember asking, oh, yeah, sorry. did you, did what happened when you said, when I asked, can we slow down? So, you know, it, it, like instantly she was like, um, no, we really need to get to the next thing on the agenda. We really need to get to the next thing on the agenda. And the next thing on the agenda was listening to Lewis Myers like have a monologue about his freaking children's life history for the next half a freaking hour um like and it's like it's that's cool that's great but i thought we were on this crazy time constraint uh and the whole thing was just incredibly frustrating because i don't i did not learn one thing that lewis meyer said um and sure i get it i understand some people need like that motivational stuff like pep talky stuff to like get moving um but i would think that the people that they hired on the campaign are already aware of that stuff and we don't need any more motivation we just needed the tools to carry out the motivation that we already have yeah um and that's why it was a little bit frustrating okay so we're gonna move on but um by the way about asking questions there uh, Lewis told us not to ask questions there. I don't know why we weren't allowed to bring up questions pretty much. I can only assume because it would make him 
look bad, that we actually had questions. I don't know. But for some reason, we were not allowed to ask questions. We were told well, expressly. So I, I, I know that I know that for our definitely in my conversation and sort of my um, recap with Sam Sukaton, who was our area um, director, uh, he was like, no, no, you're doing great. You're asking the right questions. You're pushing back um, because and we were just, I do, I just got affirmed that we were doing the right thing by going like, what the hell's going on? Yeah. But, but we were the only ones. And I have to think that it was um, because of all of the things that, what you said that you were directly told not to. Um, and then for Jenny Lynn was really the uncertainty of like, well, what's the plan? I don't know. I don't want to like take up, you know, space. Um, but that's bullshit. Like we went there just like and when we did ask that. the question about what's happening with provisional ballots, we were told we were conspiracy theorists. Which oh, absolutely. Is, and then the same thing too with gonna, grassroots. We're going like, to oh. yeah, let's say yeah. to the election stuff because, um, okay. uh, yeah, so Super Tuesday and Fiorella, I think you've been muted. You're unmuted. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so um, Super Tuesday, <laughs> if you want to take it away. Um, and then at the end, I want to play this YouTube video and then get um, Jenny and Bobby Joe's impressions on it. I do okay. want to say just super, super quickly, I'm so sorry to wrap up the whole retreat thing. I think the biggest thing that we do need to highlight through that is when we did express concerns about voter suppression and possible election fraud, instantly by Shelley and Jarrell, before we can even finish asking the question, they were both like, oh, don't worry about that. That's nothing. We have legal teams that will handle all of that. We have a whole team of lawyers that will handle all of this stuff and like just basically completely turning it like shutting us down from even being able to ask questions or discuss when I know for a fact that in 2016 in Orange County there were over two million two million ballots that were not counted and there's pictures of it sitting in the OC registrars like this was a huge issue that we were very concerned with yeah. um, so that was frustrating okay sorry for you Rella. No. no okay so I feel like I can absolutely echo what all of you have been saying because I was hearing it um, I was hearing it constantly by uh, all the field organizers. I was constantly uh, aware that this was happening. You all recall the, the letter. But um, I can provide an outsider's perspective because I got a lot of like, what the hell is Bernie's campaign doing? Why aren't they doing this? From people from who, you know, who weren't working inside the campaign, to them it was like, wow, this is really bad. This is frustrating. And a lot of people, a lot of you had to remain silent because of the NDA you signed, but um, obviously the campaign was lacking in organization. Obviously the campaign, it, it was almost to a point where it was either just, just super disorganized and just really inept to the point where it was like, okay, is this on purpose? Because what is going on here? I'm not having supplies, not having the right things available for you guys. And then of course we get to what Jenny Lynn mentioned, the elections. Now in 2016, she's right, there were 20 million um, sorry, 2 million in Orange County and millions more in LA. And I remember people being so upset all over the country, Arizona, New York, et cetera. So we all figured, hey, this time Bernie's going to do the right thing. We're going to fight back. We're going to have all the people. I was told that we had lawyers on the ground dealing with that 100% verbatim. Same thing. They told everybody that we had lawyers on the ground. In fact, I asked one of Bernie's uh, press people about, about, the um the what was happening because of it was after iowa and like are we gonna have people there i know we had the the app that was the counter thing to the shadow app in iowa so obviously knowing what was done there that should have given us a hint like hey we should be aware of this but obviously the case is we weren't and a year and a half before our elections pasta and i had been attending kind of just uh like meetings where they were going to go over the new system and how it was going to be and it was going to be the ballot marking device and it was going to be a, a electronic but you were still going to have a paper and you had to check your paper and you know um they promised that this was going to be a very simple process that we were going to have 10 days to vote that it was going to be very smooth and we kept asking is this proprietary software like we, they, you know, they told us it was open source. It turned out not to be open source. Open source basically means that if it's open source, we can all see who owns it. We can see where it goes. We have a lot of, of uh, transparency in our elections. We don't. They said it was open source. They lied. It was closed source. That means a private company 
that we don't know owns the machines. And so um, we, we started talking about that early on. We had poll workers who were being trained come on our show and talk about how they were so scared because they were Bernie supporters that this was gonna be a fiasco months before actually the election took place. And specifically what Melissa is going to show in a few minutes was the February 21st video that Pasta asked Rafa Navar, hey, you know, you guys said people aren't going to be getting these provisional ballots, but now they're talking about these other ballots, the conditionals. And if you don't, if you don't have all the right, if you don't have an ID, if, you're, uh, if your registration doesn't match, you're going, to get, you're going to get a provisional ballot. And he was like, no, 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 that's not true. Actually, everybody's going to get a regular ballot. You can, can register the it. day of. You want me to play it? <laughs> yeah, just go ahead and play it really quickly. Right. Let's see how, if I can, uh, let's see if this works right. Um, or let's see, here we go. Let me know if you can, can you see it? Yeah. You don't need to see this. Gone. Okay. And now Rafael Navarro, the state director, will take questions about the MPP program here in California or other aspects of our organizing here on the ground. Mr. Rafael, right yeah. question. It doesn't seem like there is a muddying of waters. So it seems like the people in LA have been obfuscated. The registrar has been going around and telling people that they can change their registration day of, whether they're an independent or Republican, and then cast a vote for Bernie Sanders. However, the problem is if they're not, if they haven't changed their registration by the 18th, they're given a provisional ballot. Do you guys have plans to attack these inaccuracies? So that is not actually true um, because of the recent laws that were passed. Anybody who's registered and who goes and re-registers or requests the ballot is actually not a conditional ballot, especially at the vote centers. At all vote centers, those ballots will be counted. And so even if you don't, are not registered, and you show up with an ID or if you have proof of residency, those will also be counted. Do you have legal teams on the ground in each county in case places like the Los Angeles County, which has a long history of voter uh, inaccuracies? Like, yeah. is, like any campaign, we have a voter protection uh, a campaign plan set up. We absolutely we have our hotline. We have lawyers standing by. Uh, every campaign does this every cycle. We also will have that in place. Okay. Okay, awesome. So I just want to like touch up on that. So um, that, that was after we had been raising a lot of questions on the uh, NPP stuff. In fact, it's funny, the campaign, the national campaign got word of my who I was because there's a couple instances where it proved that the campaign was all about optics, right? The campaign was more about optics and how well they looked than action, right? Because they told you guys, hey, by the way, we have a phone bank with this uh, celebrity person. You have to cancel your phone banks. You all have to show up here. That means they're about optics. That means that they're, they're more about that than the action. So what they were doing, even in Iowa, they were missing precinct captains. And I, and I, and I uh, was asked by a volunteer and a field organizer in Iowa to actually go and, and spread that they needed precinct captains in these certain precincts. The campaign got a hold of it. It went all the way to national. And they were like, you need to take that down. It, it makes us look bad, literally using the words that it makes them look bad. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, not, you're, I'm not employed by you. I'm not going to take it down. So I didn't take it down. Then there was an instance even before that where we were talking about the same thing that Pasta asked Rafa Navar. Are, we, are people going to be able to vote? If, if you don't register to vote by this date, I believe it was, I believe it was the 18th. You are going to, uh, you're going to get a provisional ballot. If you register the day of, chances are they're going to give you a provisional ballot. They change it they to condi it conditional, right? They exactly. They the change it to conditional. And, and, it, so, yeah. um, and so that's what happened. He didn't specify that. And a lot of people were still thinking, oh, this is going to be okay. Um, and we kept talking about it. But of course, if the campaign isn't on our side and the damage is done, and then they turn around and Lewis calls us conspiracy theorists. He, he spoke to um, Nico House, who's a uh, you know, who was a, like, we, we sometimes work with him. And um, he, he basically reiterated that in person. And this is something that it's not about us. Like it was about the fact that we had poll workers telling us these machines aren't working. 
the uh, people are going to be so confused by what a conditional ballot is, by what a provisional ballot is. Yes, bring your ID because a lot of the times they're not finding people in the roles. The roles weren't updating because the machine wasn't updating the roles. That's what was happening. They were having a lot of machine issues. So that's so people would go there even with their ballot and it wouldn't match the, what they had on the computer. So they wouldn't find them and they would eventually give them a provisional ballot. Now, that is something that there is zero excuse for the campaign to not have under control. We had four years, five years to have this under control. And we were told that this was taken care of. And then to, to attack the field organizers or anybody who was asking, by the way, the hotline, even calling the hotline was a problem. I called the hotline myself later on. They really provided zero information. Yeah. And so one of the field organizers while I was at work, one of the field organizers actually called the hotline to test it out. And Shelly Jackson emailed her or got back to her in some way and reprimanded her for doing that. And also we called the registrar's office in LA County because one of us would call to find, get one information, one bit of information. And then we'd call 20 minutes later and get some, some different information. Um, this is stuff we took upon ourselves we, because the campaign uh, you know, our bosses were, you know, had that whole veneer of we've got it all under control, but we did not feel like we had it under control. And I wonder if um, the others are nodding their heads. I don't know if you have similar experiences um, about just maybe lack of uh, education on this. Um, well, so one of the reasons, I don't know. Bobby, just yeah, uh, one last story from my, okay. we had, uh, we were supposed to go poll watch. And we didn't know what that meant because, you know, what, what, you know, what do you want us to do when we poll watch? And we were asking each other and nobody really knew. Um, and so we didn't get any clarity or guidance on that. And, um, and then, yeah, I mean, we, we got no, no handout whatsoever. I nearly, frankly, I nearly got arrested because I was so adamant about the fact that someone was electioneering in, in the space. So I think I, if I had been properly trained about, you know, here's what your, 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 your role is, Melissa, not this, that, I'm like, okay, and then I would know. We had zero training. Go ahead, someone else. Yeah, so I was gonna say, one of the reasons that Jarrell um, was looked at, I think, for the field, was because he had um, touted this huge like return of um, a vote by mail program where you were doing um, where you you know where the ballot collections were happening right he that's supposedly how we won ad 40 went under his guidance um, but he provided right we had no training or resources on those things except for here's this form here's this thing and figure it out like it really was they made a video, which was really good, but it was almost like very too little, too late. Like, here's the video. And I'm like, oh, we're all I think it, Yeah, it was like that I week, right? Share the video. Yeah, share the video. But we didn't, we couldn't share the video because we, I mean, I had to show it to people. I remember sitting in my kitchen, showing it to them, showing it to my ca captains on my phone because we weren't allowed to actually share the video of how to <laughs> do a ballot pickup, you know? That, and then there was also that amazing video that AOC had made for the campaign um, talking about the dates and all the specific things and the differences between the ballots that they showed us at the retreat. And then they said, it'll be ready soon. It'll be ready soon. Weeks and a month later, we were asking about it and it never went out. And, I, and I'm not sure why it never went out because like everything about it made sense. Um, even from a video perspective, because I'm also a video editor, like it looked great. I don't know what else they needed to add besides like the headers. Um, I'm not sure why it never went out. And that's like a question that I still have, but it's like, that would have been perfect um, to explain everything because California voting is complicated. It's unnecessarily complicated. And these are changes that the state of California needs to make on a legislative level. It's just unfortunate that the onus and the responsibility of educating people about this is on the voter when I feel like, and going back to a perfect use of the retreat, would have been how do we educate people on how and why California has a semi-closed primary ballot? Why, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. But we weren't trained on any 
of that. The only reason that we implemented it in Orange County is because I happen to just know this information as an activist and an organizer. And because, you know, one of our fellow colleagues, Emma, like knows this stuff like the back of her freaking hand. And she's taught our whole entire team, including our RFDs, all of the like technicalities and complications of voting um, in California and differences in every single county. And while I'm at it, I might as well add that you know, Jarrell was actually incorrect about some of the things, uh, Jarrell uh, 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 Varilla um, was incorrect about some of the things that he said about voting uh, and specifically because Orange County was different from other counties. And Emma, like, instead of replying all to an email and because she wanted to be professional and like didn't want to call him out about it, like she just replied individually, like by himself and said, no, like this is like the website, like this is why this is what it is. Um, and he never like even really like acknowledge that and she just tried to like make that apparent to other people in Orange County and we just did it on our own like we educated our people on our own but the fact that that wasn't being implemented statewide is atrocious. So um, we do have a question if you would if you're ready to move on for this we're in the halfway mark are you guys ready to move on to the next segment of this panel? Yeah I'm tired of complaining let's figure out how we fix this shit. <laughs> okay so there's a question. Um, Nick, do you want me to go ahead and ask it? Because I can see it. Or do you want to ask it? No, I also have a few that people had uh, asked questions when they registered. So I can ask a few of those. But OK, good. So that right now, uh, David has asked a question. He said, even if the volunteer app had no glitches, um, its entire structure amounted to having canvassers do an awkward doorstep survey instead of a brief and organic pitch. Is this already recognized as a lesson learned? I think he means the PDI uh, script was kind of long and there were different screens where they had to skip through. Would anyone like to address that? Is this already recognized as a lesson learned? I would honestly always teach my canvassers to treat it like, like I would always tell them having an organic conversation is a lot more persuasive than looking at your screen constantly and asking questions. I'm like, after a few houses, you'll get it down. Don't worry about the PDI thing. If any, like some people even fill out the PDI thing after. Um, what's more, um, you know, important is having an organic conversation with the person and um, understanding where it leads organically. So oh, Jenny, you bring Jenny Lynn, you bring up a point, and I think I think David doesn't see that we didn't have a at least in the LA office we didn't have direction, uh, or neither from the retreat nor from the area managers that okay um, you know this is this is what you guys should be telling your canvassers or here's how you handle this or that we were really left to our own devices to a certain extent with our with our volunteers which is good because I feel like I'm prepared for that. That's not a problem, but maybe not all the field organizers were. So well, is that already a lesson? Is that a, did we recognize the lesson learned? Yeah, I had to deal with things in my own way with my captains, but I don't know, I can't speak for the, for the general campaign staff, whether or not that was, that anything changed. So sorry, I can't answer that, David. Um, I would say that, that as far as, if you were to take some of the leadership that was on the campaign and put them into a new campaign, none of the lessons learned here in terms of building a grassroots or, or cultivating a grassroots that was already yearning to be fed um, and how to, how to lead in their own communities, they're, they're not going to do it. But as far as the folks on the ground, our field organizers who were working their own communities in their own neighborhoods, we already knew that what they were pitching to us wasn't the way to build folks and so um, but it is a different kind of organizing that is not the numbers driven thing it's it is depth it is it is um, value driven it's principle driven it's policy driven it's movement and, building and, and it's movement building and it's personal it's getting to know people on a personal level of why these things matter to them so, so that in other words we know this we have learned the lesson we knew the lesson but we can't no for the, yeah. So let's, yeah. let's the hear from The campaign was not trying to move, move a, a movement. They were, were not trying to build or sustain a movement. They were trying no. to make their numbers so they can add it to their resumes. And, right. and that's like the, the limit of how 
yes, they wanted Bernie to win. They wanted Bernie to win to fill out their resumes for their next gig. We like genuinely wanted Bernie to win and we're going to be here with the movement after they're gone. That's the difference. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, go ahead. So um, that was fine. Thank you, Nick. So you, how many questions do you have? And how um, do you I'll just keep quick? it to a few. There's, there's a lot of similar questions, but okay. um, one of the first ones was is um, to any of the panelists, how much do you believe Bernie himself knew what was going on? And if he was aware of all of this, how does that make you feel about Bernie now? Personally, I don't think he knew all the in the weeds detail stuff of what's what was going on. I think he just took advice from his higher ups and um, and that's it. But he did take their advice. He did hire them. So, you know, he's partially well, wrong. So. I, I really think that um, if we take a look at what Bernie was saying at the rallies um, and, and uh, on, on the video things that he did each week, um, his, his premise did not change. It was about getting folks who had never been involved in politics to be involved. Um, but that did not, for whatever reason, did not translate from the hiring, um, especially in a state as important as California. Uh, it did not translate into what we actually did on the ground. We did better, um, I believe, I did personally better in 2016 um, working as an unpaid volunteer um, to cultivate new voters, voter registration programs, all that stuff that, yeah, I don't think Bernie. Do you think Bernie, Bernie didn't know about it? I, I don't think, I think he was trusting that folks would take his directive especially his inner circle that should know yeah. and it just didn't happen. Does anybody have a different answer so we could kind yeah. of- Yeah, a little bit of a different answer. I feel like he knew nothing. I feel like he was completely unaware. He's, if you look at his schedule every day, this guy was going to five different events every single day, um, you know, all this stuff. It was just a very different world. I feel like he, he knew nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just add though that, that um, numerous press reports for years now I've reported about Jeff Weaver um, not being a good campaign manager. Uh, the, the staffers who resigned almost in, in mass, uh, the majority of them who comprised the first uh, staffers, top staffers of our revolution, they told Bernie uh, that Jeff Weaver is bad news. Bernie knows that Jeff Weaver is bad news and it is beyond me why he continues to employ Jeff Weaver. As I say, a, a lot of these types of things go back to a personal relationship. There's a, there's a long sordid history of top uh, politicians and public figures hiring their chauffeurs, drivers like Jeff Weaver was, becoming best friends with them and never quitting them. Uh, it almost becomes like a, a love relationship and they promote them all the way to the top and uh, Bernie still can't quit him. He, he still can't get rid of him despite all of the staffers, uh, Winnie Wong and and David Sirota and Nina Turner and, and uh, Claire Sandberg uh, and all those Our Revolution staffers who quit because of Jeff Weaver and his desire for more money, especially super PAC money, uh, or to turn Our Revolution into this like billionaire styled super PAC. Um, Bernie, Bernie can't quit him. And so Bernie, blame does have to be put on Bernie um, about the Jeff Weaver thing. I, I don't think though that Bernie knew or knows fully uh, how many other bad apples, the biggest bad apple of them all hired, that, that biggest bad apple being Jeff Weaver. I don't think Bernie knows uh, or knew about what was going on at the local level um, or even the state level, um, but perhaps he'll watch our discussion today. Uh, maybe he'll learn some more about what the grassroots experienced and saw. Um, and Just uh, really quick too, I just want to uh, point out, um, I know we, we're short on time, yeah, that can... I was told directly uh, that the campaign from campaign stuff, upper level campaign stuff, that the the reason why the campaign was run this way was because they had two, two objectives, mainly one, they weren't paying attention. Like in 2016, they had their base, us, everybody who was a loyal burner, who was excited. They expanded beyond uh, even the, the Democratic Party. We had a lot of Republican people, a lot of independents, a lot of libertarians on our side. 2020 was run different because 
the focus was always to get the centrist vote, was to get those people that may like Bernie, but they're just not sure if he can win. And so they put in all their focus on that. So that's why you saw the campaign sort of shift to more Trump is the most dangerous president in modern history, whereas in 2016, he didn't really go after Republicans as much as he did this time. He didn't really go after Democrats this time as much because that was not the campaign strategy. So overall, Bernie Sanders knew that this campaign strategy was different. His foreign policy was also different. Also another guy from Center for American Progress. And that's why you guys saw this shift. And that's what it's, uh, you know, related to. B did Bernie know? Yes. He trusted the people uh, to do the things he could not have the space to do. And he trusted wrong. Is there blame on him? Yes. Is it only on him? No. It's obviously the system of oppression and if you run somebody like bernie who's perfect in the sense of he's got no baggage on him he's the cleanest guy and you still can't win that shows you that the establishment is that bad but the one thing that i just want to bring back is we can't forget that he should have known better the whole campaign should have known better with the election issue because what's the point of getting people in the thousands to go to your stadiums and then their votes don't count so yeah. Thank you. So Nick, do you want to pick maybe two more and then yeah, we'll I'm going to kind of try to lump um, a handful of questions in here. This may be a little too broad, but take it where you would like. Um, there's a handful of questions around with all that's gone on in 2016 and 2020 here. Why should we continue to support the Democratic Party <laughs> at all? And, you know, what's what's our move forward for all of us that, you know, want to see real substantive progressive change real systemic change we know we're not going to find it in a joe biden you know and when the establishment has has shown its power you know what what is there for us to do and i think this will kind of lead us into our next discussion but yeah. um, do we I, join a third party do we start a third party um there's a lot of questions around that so i if, think uh, that's gonna that is gonna take us we could go on, we could have two hours on that, but let's let's try to keep it short. I think we also will all have a slightly different takes on it. Um, so, uh, and then, we, and then, so then Nick will say no more questions, at least for now, and we'll go. Yeah, we'll hold the rest okay. of the questions till the end and see what time we have left at the end. But we're right. I'm trying to collect them if folks want to continue to put the questions in, I'll do my best to uh, yeah. consolidate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, my, 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 when you said support to the Democratic Party, that's not does necessarily what, like when I think of what I do in the Democratic Party, it's not supporting the Democratic Party. We ain't so here for the Democratic that, Party, honey. Sorry? <laughs> we are not here for the Democratic Party, honey. We're here for Bernie. <laughs> right, right, right. So whatever Bernie had started, we're kind of here to finish, so to speak. You know, I, there's, there are so many things we could say on this, but that's, that's my perspective at the moment. Um, I'm not really supporting the Democratic Party. I'm a Bernie Krat. I'm the left winger, whatever you want to call it. And I see myself and the Field of Burn Democratic Club and other Bernie Krats as we get involved in the party. Um, and we, we, we are more and more involved, like we're elected to four year positions now, some of us within the Democrat, within the LA County Party, for example. We're there not to um, play ball, not to just kind of um, at least I am, I'm not there to shake hands and, and do all that stuff, but to push, push the envelope um, and make it a little more difficult um, because they want us to go away. And if and when there is uh, something to go to, I'm, I'm the first to jump out. So for now, I'm focusing my energies here. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, just, uh, no, uh, screw the Democratic Party. I, I respect certain people running against Nancy Pelosi like Shahid Batar. I will vote for certain people like that. Angelica Duenas, all these people challenging the status quo. But I have seen time and time again, people get in Congress and then start calling Nancy Pelosi mama bear. I have a problem with that. I'm We're putting in people to, to challenge the establishment, not be, uh, you know, not give into it. And so I believe the party is too far gone. I also think we still need to do incremental work. And I like what Melissa does. I like what other people do because it's kind of just getting progressives in there. And I'm okay with that. But for me, I think right now more than ever is not just focusing on electoral politics only, but looking at what we can do on the ground as we're seeing right now, as we speak, we are seeing people really make change by just being out there on the ground. And I think we can take that and trampoline into the next big thing, which is a general strike movement. So that's where my head's at. 
Absolutely. And definitely for myself, I, um, I am the outgoing co-chair of the, uh, we founded the Inland Empire Democratic Socialists of America chapter in Inland Empire. So um, I helped found, found that. I um, with Progressive Alliance. So we sort of started the Democrats and go lefter. Um, and, and it's, it, for me, it's, it's never about the organization, um, because organizations come and go and egos get in the way. But if we talk about policy, if we talk about principles, that's where I'm at. And, um, I, I am a peace builder. I am, you know, anti-war and anti-corporate money. So obviously I am an outsider in, even in my, in my own party as a Democrat, um, which makes me seriously consider um, whether or not that's a home for me. I am an outgoing central committee member. I did not run again. And I, Danny Garcia, our field organizer, the day that I decided that I wasn't going to run for re-election, he marked me safe from the central committee. So <laughs> I, I took that as, that's what we all kind of need to do in our own ways, is be safe from the corrupting and maddening culture of the Democratic Party and just work with um, with the folks that are willing to work. Excellent. Well, thank you all. I know that was a big question. And, and yeah, I mean, I think what people were getting at was um, not necessarily Democratic Party, but a Democratic candidate. But uh, I think all your answers were great. And I'm um, looking forward to part two. And I'll pass it back over to Melissa. OK, thank you. OK, well, that was engaging. I'm all riled up. Um, but let's finish up uh, our panel here. We're going to go into part two. Um, this part is about the delegate selection process that is happening as we speak, literally. Um, and tomorrow there will be voting and we'll talk about that. So uh, basically, the, as we've gone over, there have been, there are, there have been and there are still establishment forces within the Bernie campaign and what's left of it now. Um, we feel, and we're not alone, that they've been throwing awesome, dedicated, and hardcore burners off the district delegate candidate lists, where in the past, um, because Bobby Joe and I were both Bernie delegates, as maybe several of you are who are watching uh, in 2016, um, we ran and we were able to put our names in the, on the list for voting, and then whoever voted for us uh, did, and then we won or we didn't win. This time it's a little different. This time the campaign is um, affecting uh, that first uh, that first process, that first step in the process. So they're throwing uh, hardcore burners off the lists and not even letting people have a chance. Um, Rafael Navarre from the Bernie 2020 campaign, he said to us on a uh, phone call uh, with all state that they would be picking delegates. And actually, this was not something they readily talked about. Like. They never talked about delegates, really. Um, it was almost the, I don't remember, it was mid-February where all of a sudden, uh, you know, the purpose of our work as a field organizer was to actually get delegates. And that's when they brought it up. But for me, it's always been about delegates. But anyway, um, at the end of the campaign, probably around March 1st or so, we had a phone conference call with the state up and down in California uh, with all state uh, field staff. And uh, someone in, I think it was Orange County actually, but I could be wrong, asked, what about delegates? And so Raphael was like, oh, okay, well, I'll just tell you that um, we want delegates that will not disrupt at the DNC and that will follow the directives of the campaign. And when I heard that, I knew that uh, that is a complete opposite to what was my experience and Bobby Joe's experience, um, but that's probably what they learned from us, <laughs> from what we what were able to accomplish at the DNC. So anyway, this prompted grassroots groups to vet their own delegate candidates, like Feel the Burn Democratic Club. We went through that process, and others other groups have started to do that. Um, and then now, uh, the campaign has uh, created a uh, non disclosure agreement, behavior policy, social media policy. Uh, which is unprecedented. And basically, they're essentially um, muzzling Bernie delegates at the DNC, wherever that's going to be. Um, that's, again, something we've never had to sign or we didn't sign um, as delegates, for sure. So this is a whole other world. So uh, there's been no rhyme or reason to this, what, not that we could say, there's, see, then there's been no transparency either. So Paul, um, we'll go really quickly with Matt Berg. You wanted to say a few things about Matt Berg. Um, and then we'll talk about the other items. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, welcome again to this second part of our uh, presentation and discussion tonight, uh, also known as the purge uh, or the silencing and muzzling of uh, the delegates and delegate candidates and the leader of this attempted uh, or this successful in many ways purge and attempted silencing is Matt Berg. We are naming names tonight. Um, Matt Berg, uh, Melissa can bring up uh, on, on screen maybe. Uh, well, I guess it is on screen, or at least something is on screen. Can you see my screen now? Do you see? Yeah. Okay, okay, let's try. Uh, I'll just click on Matt Berg. And by the way, this website will be available after this um, webinar for everybody to look at. Okay, so here's Matt Berg, go ahead. So uh, Matt Berg worked uh, for the Bernie campaign in 2016. Um, uh, as you can see there, he's making over a uh, hundred uh, K, uh, to uh, work again uh, now as, uh, the lead purge agent. Um, but, um, as you scroll down here, um, uh, you're, you're going to see the NDA, right? That, uh, that he is, uh, ready, willing and able to enforce some uh, Colorado delegates are fighting back. Um, and apparently some elements of this are going to be walked back. We will see. Um, he, uh, as you look at his, his resume there, he's by trade a lawyer. Um, but he, uh, what you'll, you'll notice as we scroll down here, after working in the 2016 campaign, look at that. Who did he go work for, for DNC chair, after he worked for Hillary in the general election? None other than Tom Perez. Tom Perez, uh, right, um, who ran against Keith Ellison. Keith Ellison was endorsed and supported, promoted by Bernie and Bernie Kratz. For whatever reason, Matt Berg uh, went to work for Tom Perez um, and whipped votes for uh, Tom Perez to become the DNC chair. And obviously Matt's efforts uh, were successful. Uh, Perez defeated Ellison. So, um, now, of course, the, the question uh, with the NDA thing that he's put out um, is uh, why um, uh, are, are, is he doing this? Um, why is he wanting to get rid of real burners? Um, well, maybe the, the fact uh, that he worked for Tom Perez and Hillary Clinton uh, will give us some idea of why. Um, but uh, we'll get more into uh, some of the details here up ahead, but I just wanted to let you know uh, the name of Matt Berg. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I heard that he had interns um, looking at the social media profiles of uh, candidates for a burning uh, delegate here in California, or at least, I don't know if it, uh, just in California, but I've, I've been hearing, Similar problems of uh, actually, yeah, in Oregon and Colorado and, and whatnot that um, you know people that they fe that people that grassroots feel should have had a chance to ac actually or at least run to be a delegate were not even given the chance. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I'll open it up to everybody else now. Just to, um, to jump in real quick to connect the the, the uh, <laughs> rogues gallery from part one and this this part. Uh, remember, Matt Berg, I've been told, is I guess one of only two paid staffers overseeing this with an intern at the national level. However, um, he has been consulting with these establishment swamp creatures who ran the state campaigns and even at the local campaigns in some places uh, as to who should be selected as delegate candidates and as delegates. And um, so, you know, um, that, that, yeah, don't forget the villains from <laughs> part one. They're very much involved in, in this part two and the, and the purge of delegates and the attempted silencing of delegates. Yeah, um, I know that in the, in the campaign uh, mid-February, um, the, the area directors were asked, uh, actually asked others around, who do you recommend for, to be a delegate in, in various districts? So um, if you, essentially what that, kind of said to me was that they were taking an active role and at least in the LA area it seemed that uh, if you had a bad relationship with your boss who was asking that like I did um, as you heard uh, him berating myself and, and others my other uh, colleagues 
in front of everybody, um, basically you got blackballed. And I've heard of other uh, delegates. I was a Bernie 2016 delegate, um, you know, campaign for Bernie, staffer, volunteer, did all this, all these things. But, um, you know, I, I knew um, what I, because when I, uh, I, I went on the convo couch and I spoke out about what it was like, pretty much like what I'm doing now, what it was like to work in the LA office, because I thought it was abominable and not acceptable. So I knew that that was going to take a toll, and it could have. Um, the fact that there was no transparency in the choices that they made, um, made it worse. Um, so, I mean, that was similar to being redeployed when after, Bernie, after the 2020 campaign ended here in California, um, people wondered where, if they were going to be sent somewhere else. And because there was that lack of transparency, um, you know, I don't know, the fear, uh, there was no job security, there was, you know, rightly could be retaliation. A lot of campaign staffers were quiet and they hoped and prayed and, and whatnot, crossed their fingers to get redeployed. And it's the same thing with um, getting to be a delegate. So um, anyway, um, anybody else want to say anything? Well, I, um, yeah, I, will, I will share what I told you yesterday that there was somebody who was specifically um, when they were when they questioned why they weren't didn't make the cut, why weren't they on the list? Um, because and they were given like a specific social media post and, and a social media like date and time and you posted this so you're you have removed yourself from consideration so they were monitoring and, and already trying to rein in um any any voices um, of strength that might be a problem yeah, um, I'll echo that. And I'll just say I've been talking to Bernie organizers um, on a signal chat, very close friends of mine, um, Ohio, Wisconsin, other parts of California. They uh, were telling me specifically in Wisconsin how they chose a Warren, ex Warren supporter, and um, another, uh, like another uh, pro Biden Democrat over her who had been a Bernie supporter since 2015, the same old story. And um, I just wanna to touch base on the social media contract because a lot of the, uh, you know, the other side, and there was a couple of people who worked for the Sanders campaign who worked at a higher level that were kind of berating a lot of us, a lot of people for speaking out and saying, this is uncalled for, it's very anti-Bernie, it's legal. It's, but it's not progressive. It, it, it does not represent the Bernie sort of values. And so when they, when they uh, start saying, it, well, it's an NDA, everybody signs an NDA, it's a typical uh, you know, uh, employee thing. It's like, yeah, but delegates, they're not employees of the Sanders campaign. One, as Melissa said, in 2016, they weren't muzzled. They were allowed to speak to media. They were allowed to say things. These are independent adults that are capable of, of speaking their mind. And for them to really have to walk on eggshells and for the campaign to go as far back as 2016, 2017, to look at what you posted is a little bit ridiculous. And I think it goes to further the idea that this whole campaign, um, you know, has been all about like bringing in, it's been taken over by the establishment. It's been about bringing people in for Biden. And I, I just have to say, I have very, very little faith we're going to get anything in the delegate process because we don't have the majority of us who are going to fight for Medicare for all and demand that from Biden. We have people like John Kerry on the board for crying out loud. John Kerry, do, you, do we really think we're gonna make anything, any, any sort of coalition with people like John Kerry, people like Simone Sanders? Um, I firmly don't believe that. And I think that's why they took, they took those people out of the equation and also the fact that they might replace Joe Biden is a whole other thing. They do not want any sort of riots now more than ever. And um, it, it's, it's just, again, I just wanna end with, it just goes against the whole idea of being a burner, especially the part about filming videos. You well, we'll can't actually, even document that. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at the NDA in just a second, but as a, as a former Bernie delegate and an ardent Bernie supporter, and I did put my name in the hat to run in my district, but I wasn't allowed to be put on the ballot because of the Bernie, the Bernie campaign didn't allow me to do that. And there was given no reason why. Um, 
I'm actually, you know, one would think, oh, you're bitter. I'm not. I'm actually thankful. And I feel bad for my fellow Bernie candidate, you know, Bernie delegate candidates that also are torn about being on, being related or being part of or being representing this mm -hmm. kind of a campaign that it, whatever it's become. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, the, yeah, it's the, the, the establishment. Basically, the campaign seems to be doing the bidding for the establishment or the party. So it's it's no longer a Bernie campaign for me anyway. So I don't feel bad. I feel relieved. To me, the whole delegate thing is um, intrinsically related to the, the carrot that they dangled about redeployment. Um, they were never clear about anything. Um, I had been asking about delegates. I remember specifically since the retreat, um, you know, they would never educate us or talk to us about delegates. They would just always defer it as, oh, we have a team for that. That's the delegate team. They're handling that. But I was more like, well, I want to inform my volunteers and like galvanize my volunteers and teach them, you know, why it's important to not symbolically leave the Democratic Party, at least wait until after the DNC so we can elect legit Bernie delegates. Um, and there was no information, even on the calls, the pointless calls like there was no information about delegates whatsoever and and it's still a mystery of like who exactly selects these delegates and I mean I don't know if it's the same team or a different team but it seems like you know if you didn't get picked to get redeployed you're also not going to be able to be a delegate and, and it's and it seems like it's a very small pool of people that are higher up on the top I mean others can correct me if, if I'm wrong but it just it seems like you know go ahead. Yeah, I think um, it might depend because if you, what I've looked around, what I've seen is if you were indeed redeployed, your kind of your prize was you could become a delegate or something. Um, so, and you were on the list chosen by them. But anyway, there is no rhyme of reason, um, at least not that's been exposed to us or shared with us. And this brings us- like We went through like weeks and weeks of fact finding and trying to figure out what this formula is, if it's the social media posts, if it's you know, your background in delegate work or experience or, or democratic party work. And you know, after just like weeks and weeks of trying to figure this out, it really just more came down to, if you're a part of the cool kids club, then you're going. If well, you're not a part of the cool kids club, then you <laughs> yeah that's the that's the shroud of secrecy that they can operate under and they operated well under it um except for a few rogue people like myself <laughs> but um so if so i'm just keeping an eye on the time we don't we only have about 15 minutes left so um i just want to quickly uh share with you what because you know because of what all of this background with uh, how the campaign has been um, making decisions about who is in the cool kids club. Um, different groups have kind of come out uh, to do their own vetting. Um, Feel the Burn Dem Club LA is one of those groups. Um, so we created a questionnaire and uh, an extensive one and we got it out to uh, pretty much everybody that was that put their name in the hat to be a Bernie delegate in all of LA County. Um, and I'm gonna like one of the examples of the, the questions uh, was um, give an example of when you spoke truth to power um, or would you withhold your vote in X situation um, or would you be willing to protest even if the campaign says no. So we, we wanted to offer a counter uh, survey to what the Bernie campaign put out because many of you probably filled out uh, a very bland questionnaire from the Bernie campaign that they were screening, that they screened you with, which is, you know, put your social media link right here, which obviously they went and checked, and did you campaign for Bernie, that kind of thing. But we had something more in depth, and I want to just encourage everybody to go um, use that um, when, you know, if you're going to be um, participating in the election. Now, the election is starting tomorrow. Um, there's been emails that have already been sent out from the Bernie 2020 campaign and there's already confusion about it. Um, some of the emails have been going into the spam mailbox. So please, if you're expecting to get a ballot from the Bernie 2020 campaign, um, um, you need to look in your spam mailbox, by the way. Um, you needed to have registered by May 28th if you wanted to participate in this. Now, we're not going to go into all the details about, you know, what it should have been and what happened with COVID-19 and so on. But this is where we're at right now. It's an online election. 
Um, but I'll click on this link. Let's see where it takes us. Um, yeah, so back to the, our process. It talks about the process here on our, on our website. Um, you can pick up a, a blank survey and you can also see the responses that all candidates that answered our survey and got it in by the deadline uh, responded. So um, I highly encourage everybody to look at everybody's responses. Um, and then we have our vetted candidates right here. So you can look for, look up your CD. Um, there obviously will be more, um, more candidates that you can vote for, but um, if you want, feel free to use our survey mechanism. Um, and yeah, so I think I said what I wanted to say about checking your um, mailbox. Again, you needed to have, um, hold on, I'm getting lost here. You needed to have already registered. So if you didn't register with the Bernie campaign, you're not gonna be voting tomorrow, unfortunately. Um, so let me go to the next screen. Um, oh, other groups like the Bernie Delegates Network, Santa Cruz, Our Revolution Santa Cruz, and Feel the Burn San Fernando Valley also had their own vetting process, again, as a result of the Bernie campaign's vetting process that we didn't uh, necessarily agree with. Um, so Fiorella, here's the slide about the NDA um, and the social media contract and the behavior policies contract. Um, this, this came from a Washington Post article. That's when you first heard about it, right, Fiorella? Yeah, I mean, the Washington Post, out of all people, <laughs> was the one that broke the story. Obviously, a lot of us are suspect of the Washington Post. But um, they actually got these documents ahead of time, and then some delegates were made known of it. It basically just talks about uh, you can't talk to press if you're a delegate. You can't make any disparaging remarks. You can't engage with anybody that... Um, that you might disagree with in a disrespectful way. The problem with that is that you guys can can tell me uh, that you uh, ex staffers. A lot of the times when the campaign met negatively about a candidate, they met anything about a candidate. I mean, I remember being being told uh, even as a volunteer, you could not talk about Elizabeth Warren's um, fault faulty policy. You, you, could, you couldn't talk about Joe Biden's policies. You always had to focus on. Uh, Bernie Sanders. The problem with that in retrospect, obviously, that we know is that a lot of people felt like he didn't differentiate enough between Joe Biden and himself. And he didn't differentiate enough between Elizabeth Warren and that. So this kind of mirrors that sort of same ideology or sort of same strategy where they're saying you can't, you know, negatively talk about anybody. And of course, the point of going into a convention, obviously, if you're not going to win is to get a platform that represents the progressive movement. How are you going to do that without having any sort of opposition to the party? It just doesn't make sense to me. It's like they're calling for civility. And right. Decorum, and that those are things that... <laughs> That's not our language, really. In the no. it could be. Because but. They, don't want, they didn't want a repetition of 2016. And it's frustrating because I just really feel like, you know, Bernie, well, at least old school Bernie or whatever, would not be down for that. <laughs> right. I, I want to also jump in here, as I said earlier, why would uh, Bernie be more Trumpian and Bloombergian uh, than Biden, right? Donald Trump and Mike Bloomberg are infamous for their NDAs. Elizabeth Warren, to her credit, famously slayed Mike Bloomberg over NDAs, uh, specifically regarding sexual harassment that he committed. Um, Joe Biden, when he was interviewed on Morning Joe by Mika Brzezinski, when he finally broke his silence on Tara Reid, she asked him about NDAs, and he definitively said, I have never done and don't do NDAs. So again, I ask the question, why is the Bernie campaign doing this? Why are they being more Trumpian and Bloombergian uh, you know, than, than even Joe Biden? And uh, I, I put the blame at the feet of Matt Berg and the other establishment swamp creatures um, that uh, are running things right now for Bernie HQ 2020. Well, I think there's nothing more um more like scary to establishment folks than something that feels impolite rather than like be offended by war or uh, uh, immigrants in cages. They're offended that you, um, your tone, <laughs> that's, this is all, it's all tone policing. It's all like virtue signaling. It's all like we're on the right side, but you know, say it nicely. And, um, 
in particular, you know, engage with other delegates with respect. Um, in 2016, there was two instances, and one in particular that stands out is uh, we finished this whole go round of like what the world needs now is love. Um, it was a you know the bunch of celebrities up on stage singing it. The whole audience was singing it. And then somebody like finished off the singing part on stage and said like, you know, you gotta ask for what you want. And then there was like three women, um, Bernie delegates who was like, we want peace. And this one other delegate turned around and says, so do we, so shut up. Um, <laughs> the rules only apply to progressives. The rules of, of civility only apply um, to those who, who, who aren't willing to toe the line. So the party though is trying as much as possible to get, um, to get folks who will just, you know, sing Kumbaya and raise and hold hands um, as, we, as they attempt to install um, these candidates, this candidate for president against Trump and lose, I believe, again. <laughs> Yep. So there is um, a petition. Um, mm -hmm. if you want to talk about that? I tried to put it in the chat. I jumped into the chat, and I can't wait to go back uh, and read all the chat later. Um, but um, Fiorella, do you want to talk about the petition? Yeah. So it was just a, a petition we wrote up where we were talking about how um, you know we didn't agree with the the specific parts, whether it was the social media part, whether it was the NDA, we just spoke about how we, we didn't agree with the language and we weren't comfortable even, even if we were delegates, like I, I, I applied, I obviously got denied like everybody else that I know is like the um, most amazing activist for Bernie. But um, that even, you know, it wasn't about us getting completely just thrown out. It was more about the fact that this isn't representative of the Bernie Sanders movement. We feel like we are being censored when we shouldn't. Now more than ever, we need to speak our voice and we need to provide opposition to the Democratic Party if we plan on getting anything. And we outlined exactly what the things that we didn't like um, on it were. And, you know, we collected, I think, I think we made it to 500 signatures almost, or more. Almost uh, 100. And it's on, uh, what is it? Um, which, which platform? It's on change.org. Change.org. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, Good. yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I put the link, or I'm going to try again, uh, to, so people can sign that petition as well. There's uh, close to 500. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A, uh, Nick. Um, we're, kind of, we're kind of at the end. Um, yeah. Was there, uh, let me think, uh, let me think for the next one. Yeah, so this is our second to last slide, pretty much. Um, the delegate um, election starts tomorrow, June 5th. Please vote for hardcore burners. Um, some delegates and candidates will, quote, go to Wisconsin DNC, wherever that is, um, whatever that's going to look like. Um, there's the petition that you all can sign against delegate oppression and censorship. Uh, let's try to get up to 500. And then, of course, I'm going to post this website uh, because there's a lot more uh, that you haven't seen tonight. It's the Bernie 2020 autopsy um, that you guys can um, read into. Um, but let's see, what about some last minute questions? So what we have left, most of them, I think you've answered or were answered in the chat. Um, but there was a question around, seems like most of the problems were in the upper campaign management. Um, going forward, how would we go about changing that and get more grassroots activists into those leadership roles? So That's an amazing question. Who wants to? Yeah, I, I actually answered that in the chat very briefly, and, and uh, I said, got to hire them. But of course, Jeff Weaver, Chuck Rocha, Fai Shakir didn't, and said they hired establishment hacks to run the, the upper ranks of the campaigns in the state. So I don't know how you really get around that. You know, um, you, you've got to hire grassroots people, uh, movement people. Um, Bernie had a number of them in the upper ranks, but they weren't in charge of hiring. It was Jeff Weaver. It was Chuck Rocha, by Shakir. So, you know, uh, people like Winnie Wong and, and Claire Sandberg and Nina Turner, they didn't have power over the, the hiring really, uh, at least to the same extent that Weaver, uh, Shakir and Rocha did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on that or? 
I'm okay. busy putting things in the chat now. <laughs> yeah. so someone else uh, wants to jump in. I mean, it was, um, I mean, yeah, you got to hire them, but you also, you got to start the foundation, right? You can't run a campaign that's a grassroots campaign with the same strategy that the establishment runs their campaign. And that's what this campaign attempted to do and failed. You also have to have the proper mechanisms to understand that you are taking the entire establishment. And with that, you know how we had the uh, the app to counteract the shadow app. Well, we need we need people literally on the ground monitoring our elections. We need to be fighting with lawyers at every single turn when something doesn't look right. And if you guys don't, you know, if you guys aren't sure about the election stuff, you can go back and watch the videos we did where we have election integrity specialists talking about not just the exit polls, but like the, the voter suppression in combination with everything else. You have to have a, an entire infrastructure that is created, that is separate from the establishment. Because if you're forced to hire from the establishment, you're gonna end up getting co-opted the same way. So it has to, it has to be a grassroots run campaign foundation to, the, to all the way to the top. And we had a, a one question which was, um, answered by Jenny Lynn, but if others want to respond, um, should we vote for Joe Biden? Mm -hmm. You gotta do what you feel like doing. <laughs> well, I can Thank tell you for acknowledging how I answered that question. I don't vote for rapists. I, I second that. Um, really quick, I noticed on the Q&A that Ken Warfield has said that he was told that National did not know what the states were doing for the delegate process. Uh, I don't know who told him and who was involved in, in, in that, if that person was knowledgeable, but I mean, Matt Berg was a National, um, you know, employee, so I'm not sure if that's yeah. it. But we don't know anything about anything because it's non-transparent. Well, I did answer that, though, to Ken. I don't, I guess, I don't know if it's visible, but uh, we have numerous reports that, yes, the, these, these villains in the upper ranks of California and other states were making recommendations and rejections to Matt Berg, to the national staff. Um, so there was very much an, uh, an intimate involvement between the two. Yep. All right. Well, we've got three minutes left. I feel like we should all just type in the chat and like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Just take a second to thank all the panelists, um, you know, for a great discussion, very informative and helpful, and uh, and all the attendees for for being here tonight. Um, I know there's a lot going on in the world right now, and um, I think this is an important discussion. Mm -hmm. I think you guys really helped us a lot and better understand this, and hopefully, um, you know, we can collectively move forward and and push those policies that that we all know we need and and we all believe in. So I just wanted to say thank you to you all. Yeah, thank you all. Thank for you. Thank you, thank you, Melissa, thank you. for putting this together and working oh, so hard on it. No problem. Wait yeah, till no. the website comes out. It's going to be fun. Yeah, no. <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I also do want to say uh, before uh, we wrap, uh, before you you know log off, make sure to save the chat if you want to save it. Uh, it's that little button at the bottom right, those three little uh, bubbles, uh, three little dots. Um, you just click on that, click Save Chat, and you'll have it. Um, what I was typing in right now before I started talking was, you know, please do vote here June 5th through 7th for real hardcore burners instead of all these establishments and mystery candidates that Matt Berg and, and these uh, establishment swamp creatures uh, came up with. Um, um Nick, I'm sorry to cut you off, Paul, but uh, Nick, someone says there is no way to save the chat and there are no but three buttons. Those three little dots, like right when it says all panelists and attend, there's three little dots right next to it. You do have to be on the desktop though, I think. Oh, okay. I see it in mine, but I'm seeing a bunch of people typing, nope, not on desktop. You have okay. to permission, question mark, nope. It may be because we're in the webinar format and if anyone needs any information you can reach out to me i can I, I will be posting the full recording on uh california progressive alliance website um, okay so i i have just clicked those three dots on my end and i have saved chat so melissa will also have yeah so i think the panelists may have access but because it's the webinar format oh yeah, um, I just maybe saved the chat. So I mean, I I saved it. I don't know where it saves to, but it just says chat saved. It creates a yeah. It creates a default folder on your desktop. All right. Under, like, so, Zoom calls with the date. Can um Nick? Will there be a way? What I can do is I can see if someone could put on the website 
the safe chat and then this uh, webinar. Can we put it on that Bernie autopsy um, website? Yeah, we can, we can, I'll talk with you on that. We'll make sure we get all the information out to everyone. And if there's anything missing, you guys just let us know if there's, there's something that you think we missed, but we'll have the chat available. We'll have the uh, full recording available. Um, and any other I do want to say too, just as you know, um, just as a goodbye to everybody. Um, I do want to make sure that you know people understand like the separation between the campaign and Bernie as an individual, and that we all know and acknowledge and understand. Um, you know, just like the big difference of of what that is. Like you know, a lot of us even on the chat here like are still wearing our Bernie shirts. Like we're still hella like actual Bernie like for a reason. But the campaign, especially how it was brought out on a local level, on a statewide level. Is hella problematic um, you know even it, it's a good start sure maybe like um, at least it, it is the only campaign that provided health care and that had a union and there is something to be said for that our union was powerful I did learn a lot from our union and our shop stewards and everything like that was really important especially um, to me um, I, I don't think that there's any other campaign that had anything, anything like that um, you know but other than that like you, there definitely is so much room to improve at the end of the day the campaign was still operating under the patriarchy and under crony capitalism um so other than that black lives matter <laughs> and good luck tomorrow you guys uh, who are running to be bernie delegates um good luck and, all right um, can i hey melissa i know we didn't talk about it but can we can i finish off with a little bit of a a little bit of spitfire poet poetry to the folks and and some rage behind me how long is this poem? It's like 30 seconds. Okay, go for it. <laughs> All right. Is that okay, Nick? Is that okay? Absolutely. No, okay, I fully so, support that. So I am the I am, like you are the I am, like we are the we that Muhammad Ali talks of in the world's shortest poem and biggest truth. Me, we. The we that is us, not me. I have been known to forget who I am only to be reminded in fearful and humiliating ways but it's cool, let's say, because sometimes that's what it takes. I am what I choose, and I choose to remember a different way now, a higher way, always reaching higher, always learning, giving, being more than I was before, because the I am is ever expanding beyond infinity, or as Buzz says, to infinity and beyond. And then it contracts like a breath, and the journey begins again. Right now, I am breathing in and the expansion is inevitable so that I am filled enough that I can breathe life into you. And I can breathe life into all those who cannot breathe on the daily, on the weekly, on the fucking centuries of this country. Let's change America. Uh, let's start with ourselves. Thanks everyone. Oh. Thank you, Bobby Joe. Black you. Lives Matter. Guys, love In solidarity. Matter. Smash the patriarchy. Yeah. Bye. Bye. You all take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening to Ray all day. <laughs> all right. All right.